So, welcome. We are here for our second STEM colloquium this semester, and this STEM colloquium is part of the Barnard Noyce Teacher Scholars Program, and with it has a course attached. And I'm really excited for tonight's talk because tonight we have one of our own speaking, um, one of our Noyce scholars, Audrey Massman is a Barnard uh, senior and she's doing secondary science. She is working with Brian Gordon at MS, uh, PS333 or the Manhattan School for Children and they are going to talk to us about the project they've been working on. This is really exciting for us because this is the first time that we've had one of our own noise scholars present the work that they've been doing in the classroom and we get to see what is coming of our program. So welcome and let's welcome Brian and Audrey. There's a form going around. Please sign. Uh, so the title of our talk is Hands-On STEM Teacher Education. But we really wanted to start out, since this is a colloquium, with actually getting talking amongst you guys in the audience. So a lot of you are, are going to become teachers, so I would just like you to turn to the neighbor and say why you're going into teaching, or if you're not, why do you care about teaching? All right, if you guys could wrap up your thoughts in the next few seconds. We are going to tell you our answers to those questions. Um, so I actually I began my uh, my ascent into the world of, of education through uh, informal science education as an environmental educator. Um, I spent two years working at a place called the Taconic Outdoor Education Center, um, and I worked with mostly groups from New York City. Um, and it was a, it was a really important experience for me because it, it kind of showed me that. Well, one, the importance of formal science education, such as an outdoor ed center, a museum, um, but also that I wanted to get involved in the formal science world. Um, and when I entered in, it kind of had its initial challenges. Uh, going from the, going from the outdoors to the confines of a classroom was was definitely a, a struggle for me, and and still has its own challenges. But I feel I would like to think I've, I've gained at least a little bit of success with. Um, managing a classroom, um, being able to deliver science content effectively. Um, so that kind of just really what I wanted to mention about that. Okay. Um, so my, uh, my teaching journey is, is quite a bit shorter. Um, I started out with this organization called Let's Get Ready that provides free SAT tutoring to underserved high schoolers. Um, so I really enjoyed what I was doing there, helping students get ready for the SAT. Uh, it was the first time I, I fully bought that saying that you don't know it until you teach it. Um, I didn't realize how little I understood algebra until I was trying to explain it to other people. But, but through the process of teaching, I got to understand it a lot better and I really enjoyed that. And I also found that I had a bit of a knack for explaining things. Um, but this was a very much, it was a test prep organization. There was a pacing guide. It was, it was really all but scripted. So there was really something lacking there in terms of what I think teaching really is. So I went on and I worked with the Forest Service. That's my boss um, doing something that she taught me to do, which is talk to visitors about what they were seeing in the forest. And with the Forest Service, I found a much better version of pedagogy um, than I saw with Let's Get Ready. There was a lot of focus on involving the visitor in the learning process. What do they want to know? Um, cultivating a sense of wonder and a sort of ownership over the natural world, and there was ultimately a goal of action. So that was all great stuff, but as a conservation educator, I found that most of what I was doing was really persuasive speaking, not teaching. Um, and as I realized that summer that I did want to become a teacher, I also realized that I did not want to be in a position of persuading my students, even about something I care a lot about, like land use, which is what I was talking about a lot of times with the Forest Service or even something more fundamental like the importance of the scientific method. As a teacher, I wanted to just provide my students with ways to come up with their ideas about things like that on their own. So there was a bit of a gap between the goals of my teaching experiences with those organizations and what I thought teaching should be, and I was hoping that the Barnard Education Program would fill that gap. <laughs> um, 
So my plan for this semester was, in addition to the traditional activities of observing um, a teacher, that I would get a bit more hands-on, and I modeled this independent study off of a course called Science in the City, which is not being offered this semester, so I couldn't just take it. Um, I would, first of all, plan and deliver inquiry-based science lessons, including field trip lessons, so kind of getting my hands dirty a little more, and also interview students, and then to present what I learned to you guys. Um, so this is in many ways consistent with how I think that students learn, and, and how as a teacher I'll be teaching my students. It's, it's sort of similar to how I'm trying to teach myself right now. Um, it's hands-on, it's authentic, really, in a classroom, and also the capstone is, is something meaningful with particularly things that are socially meaningful, I think can be really powerful. So to start off, I will talk about the student interview portion of this whole endeavor. Um, with Let's Get Ready, we would give diagnostic tests to find out where students were lacking in, in their skills in math or test taking or English, but that really wasn't what I was trying to do here. I wasn't trying to find a deficit. I was more interested in what they knew than what they didn't know. Um, this goes back to this whole idea of funds of knowledge, which this guy named Mole is really into. Um, funds of knowledge are basically, you know, students don't come into the classroom as empty vessels that the teacher can just pour knowledge into. Uh, they have all of these other experiences and preconceptions and attitudes that should be embraced and built upon instead of ignored. Um, and in particular, I was going to interview students about evolution, and I just there's nothing really more naive in my mind than thinking that students have not heard anything about evolution before. It's in cartoons, it's on the news, they, they have ideas, and we need to kind of tease those out. But also, it just gives me a chance to talk to students about the thing that I'm going to be teaching them about to get to know them better before I actually have to lead a classroom. But last and certainly not least, interviews are actually very beneficial to the student who's being interviewed. It gives a student a chance to define her existing ideas about a topic so that as she's constructing new knowledge for herself, she knows her starting point, she can work with it, um, instead of just having a sort of confusion, but she doesn't know why because she hasn't figured out what the existing thought was. So a chance to, to verbalize those existing ideas. And also to have them validated without any regard to whether they're accurate or not. In a classroom, even if you're in a very positive sort of environment where wrong answers are embraced as an important part of the process of learning, um, it'll still be by the end of the period, you'll have had your answer corrected, or certainly by the end of the unit. But I think that there's something valuable about just having an adult listen to your idea for its own sake. It's also a chance to, to speak one-on-one -on -one with an adult, practice all of that academic language. And it's finally very helpful to the student because then the teacher is no longer making lessons based on assumptions of what they already know. It's based on actually what they tell them that they know. And as opposed to a, a sort of pencil and paper pretest with an interview, there aren't any of those confounding factors of their reading and writing ability. You're really just zeroing in on their content knowledge. So for, for lessons, in terms of prior knowledge, it's, it's, it's absolutely essential to have prior knowledge, as Audrey was saying, um, to see what your students actually know before you teach a, a concept. Um, so I use a wide variety of formative assessments to inform my instruction. Um, it has its own challenges in terms of, I, I work at a, an ICT school, so I, I um, teach four classes. Uh, one of my seventh grade classes is an ICT class, so I teach with a special education teacher, and same with one of my eighth grade classes. And one of the things we're constantly toying with and, and trying to figure out um, when we meet once a week is how we're going to group kids uh, based on based on the formative assessments we've given them. It could be for a topic, um, it could be for the unit. Sometimes we'll have groups together for a week. Sometimes it'll be for a couple of days. Sometimes it'll be for a whole semester, as it has been for this this past one because we've had pretty good groupings. Um, and we we group them based on ability and based on their needs. So. Um, the middle school level, their social emotional needs, um, and their academic ability. Um, so we we believe in, in mixed ability grouping, heterogeneous grouping. So we're we're pairing kids um, that are not necessarily so high level, not necessarily so low level. We try to mix them up so they can learn and grow with each other and from each other. Um, just in terms of a general lesson structure, some, some something that I have. I've definitely grown with and I, I struggled with at the beginning of my, my teaching career was uh, 
I was constantly trying to basically just like get through a concept and trying to just, there was so much content to cover, so much curriculum, and all I wanted to do was basically just have the kids know the material. And it's taken me a while to get to the point of, of realizing that the kid, the students need to investigate the topic for themselves first. And that's at the heart of what inquiry education is all about. Um, and what I found is that with a lot of students, it does help to increase their engagement and ownership of the content. Um, you know, it's kind of like the saying that the less you talk, the more they learn, and I, I really do believe that. Um, and in a true workshop model, the teacher is acting as a facilitator of knowledge. Um, and typically, after, after the student has had the learning experience, then you bring it back, and then that's the point where you can debrief, um, go through notes, sketching and labeling, go over videos, and, and, and have them model, share out to each other, um, so they actually are taking part in the learning instead of just sitting there um, being passive learners. They're active learners. This is a lot of <laughs> this is a lot of information here, and I'm not going to go over all of it. But basically, there's 20 things that I'm typically thinking about going into a given lesson. Um, you can see them all here for yourself. Some of the things that I definitely focus on is differentiation, um, high and low level questions, and the learning expectations I have for each student based on where they're at, um, what work products, what I'm expecting them to produce from a given lesson, um, what activities they're actually going to be doing. Um, something that's big at our school is accountable talk. We're a, uh, we're a responsive classroom school, so we're not really punitive when it comes to behavior management. We try to let kids figure things out for themselves. Um, accountable talk is one of those pieces, um, how you actually interact with your peers on a daily basis. So some other things that I find extremely helpful, especially at the middle school level, is that some kids have a tendency to call out a lot, so we have a parking lot. If they have really good questions, they can write that down and put it up on a parking lot and we can come back to that. Um, as Audrey had you do at the beginning of, of the talk, you guys did a turn and talk, which is always helpful for getting kids to, to talk to each other hear what each other have to say. Um, and then just, for me, one of the biggest things that I've, I've gotten better at is building relationships with kids. Um, it's, it's absolutely essential to have a good rapport with your students. Um, and the last thing for me is just planning an organization, which I think has been one of the areas that I've grown the most in, um, in terms of just knowing exactly what's gonna happen 10 weeks down the road. It's, it's necessary, um, or else you just are going to constantly fall behind. So keeping in mind that prior education is, is beneath all of those things that Brian was just talking about, everything that goes into a lesson, uh, this is how I, I interviewed students to, to kind of get their ideas about what science is and what evolution is. I started off, um, I didn't want them to feel like I was trying to find out right and wrong answers, um, so I told them that I wasn't. Um, and I also tried very hard not to ask leading questions because children are very susceptible to leading questions um, and will change their answers and their thoughts and you won't get an idea of what they really think. They'll just be saying what they think you want to hear. Um, so I would ask them to elaborate sometimes, but I would just say why, why not, can you elaborate instead of really saying any specific keywords that might um, give them a tip off that they should be saying something that they weren't going to say. Um, it was by no means a random sample. Um, I did try to get a mix of personalities, a mix of abilities, but it ended up being five girls and two boys, four from the upper level class, three from the lower level class, and even though it was only the seven students, uh, there are only 60 seventh graders, so I got more than 10% of the grade, so that's a pretty good look at our population. And these are the questions I asked them. How would you define science? What do scientists do? What is evolution? What evolves? How long does evolution take, which I realize is a kind of dumb question. I kind of <laughs> regret asking it in that way because you could say anything, but I did just want to get a sort of vague idea of the time scale that they thought this was happening on. And finally, since we were working on the heredity and DNA unit, uh, how is DNA related to evolution? So first of all, to talk a little bit about the conceptions of science that came out from their answers to the first two, um, some of them did not seem to totally get that science was something other than a class that they went to. So they would tell me that it was fun, and they couldn't really go past that. Uh, I'll read one little transcript. How would you define science? It's pretty fun most of the time. Is there anything else you would use to define it? It's boring sometimes. 
So just really no other ideas besides how he personally interacted with the class. But some other key words that came up a lot, things like experiments and discovery are getting at the process of science. Those are really important. Information and knowledge is a lot more consistent with the sort of linguistic definition of science. Science means knowledge. Um, I saw a lot of people going a bit too broad with science is everything. Scientists do anything. And then other students would get sort of too narrow and just start listing topics. It's the body, it's the brain, it's space. Just going through the different units that they cover in science. Um, and the, the next transcript that I'll read to you from this particular portion was a student who was having this sort of interesting inner conflict between uh, um, the applied aims of science, things like technology, medical advancements, and then the basic aims of just finding things out because you want to. Um, so I asked him, how would you define science? It's more progressing toward things than to fix things. And then he paused. Sometimes he used it to fix things, but mostly to learn about space, the cell, the brain, and then he trailed off. What do scientists do? Figure out ways to use opportunities to fix things. And then he paused again, but more to learn. Um, so he went back and forth in, in both of his responses, and particularly in the first response, it seems like he was trying to, to get into abstraction, to get into a really conceptual definition of science, but when he saw a conflict in that definition, he retreated into some more concrete things, just listing the topics. Um, so going into the concepts of evolution that I saw in the interview, uh, the time scale that people were mentioning was pretty short. Uh, the biggest number I heard was a million, and it was in anywhere from one second to a million years. Um, and, but a more typical answer would be a long, long time, like centuries. Um, so seeing from that, I had expected that they would have thought evolution was over tons and tons of generations, and that I would you know, kind of push them to think about evolution that has happened on a human time scale, but it seems like I'm actually going to have to be pushing in the other direction. So that was good to find out. Um, another really interesting dichotomy that popped up was people would either say everything evolves as an answer to what evolves or people evolve. Um, so that does kind of make sense to me because if you think about images of evolution, I guess there is like the foot, the fish with the feet or whatever, but it seems like a more common one is the monkey becoming the ape becoming the man. So if that was the image that came to their minds, then they would say people. Um, and I was kind of interested that most of them said that DNA was what changed to produce evolution. So that last question, they were making a pretty good prediction there. Um, and so I'll read a few transcripts for you of these two, because every, everyone loves kids say the darndest things. Um, so the first one is, is sort of about how just asking very simple questions for students to elaborate can get past what seems like a very super, superficial knowledge of a topic. Um, what is evolution? The process of which things evolve. Can you elaborate on that? To fill it in, it deforms it, kind of. What do you mean by that? Like, the deformed version of a fish is that it can't breathe above water. So at first, it seemed like he knew absolutely nothing about evolution, and he was just playing with the words, turning, turning the noun into a verb. But, but simply asking him to elaborate, he got into what sounded to me almost like a 19th century philosopher talking about it, filling things in, deformities. But also, the word deformed gets at mutation, which is where the wrong material of evolution comes from. Um, and then also seeing that he did have that image of, of the fish coming out of the water. Um, and the idea that breathing was a better thing than uh, breathing above water was better than breathing below water and that there was this sort of progression up to people, which is a misconception that you would need to push against as a teacher. Uh, the next story um, is actually probably one of my favorite experiences that I've had in this classroom. Um, we have an English la language learner and when I interviewed her, she had great things to say about what science was, what scientists did, but when I asked her what is evolution, she'd never heard the word before and had no idea. So I printed out the word in her native language and showed it to her, and at first she said it out loud, she was familiar with it, but couldn't think of anything to say about it, and so I moved on. Um, but then she ran across the classroom to me about 15 minutes later and said, I remember what the word means. It means changes through generations. We learned that in fourth grade. I just forgot about it because it was so long ago. Um, so that was pretty exciting. Um, and just you know the power of just typing in a word to Wikipedia and printing the title into other language and showing that to the student and helping them to see what prior knowledge they have and to help them make those connections between knowledge they had before coming to the US and knowledge that they're getting here. So now what I'm working on is how do we apply all this stuff that I learned uh, to how we're teaching evolution. And the only, the only really concrete idea I have is 
about the time scale that I need to start making them think about things taking longer. So, you guys thought you weren't going to have to talk to each other again, didn't you? <laughs> but you will. Uh, before we move into talking about the field trips, I want you guys to turn preferably to a different neighbor, I guess, but whoever you'll, you'll actually talk to, and tell them about a field trip that you remember. <laughs> oh, that we went to? Yeah, that you personally have, have gone on. No. All right, if you guys could wrap up your thoughts once again, we will tell you about um, sort of our, our ideas about field trips and also the field trip that we took our students on. Um, so I hope that the field trip we talked about was a positive experience because I think both of us have very positive feelings about field trips. And in particular, uh, we're gonna be talking about a trip to a museum. Student groups who visit museums show um, positive cognitive gain and also po more positive attitudes towards learning as a result of the trip. Uh, we're gonna cut off a little bit, but it's very hard to predict what, visitor, what, a vis what experience a visitor is going to get out of a museum because in the words of uh, these two guys, uh, museums are co-constructed by the eyes, memories, and identities of the visitors. Identity filters and shapes the experiences of visitors, but it is one of the dimensions that has changed as a result of an experience with a museum. So the idea that the visitor and the objects in the museum are in conversation, and the way the objects are being perceived is changing as the perception is changing the person. Um, to sort of, uh, take that uh, abstraction out a little further, we can talk about a contextual model for museum learning. Uh, and sort of at the core, there is the personal context. There's your own attitudes about the museum and the topic at the museum, um, how you're feeling that day, your prior knowledge. And then outside of that is the social context, which is all of the people who you're at the museum with, the other visitors, the museum docents, if you went with your family or a student group, teacher, all of those other people who are there with you and how you interact. And then finally, there's the physical context, um, which is the actual objects that are at the museum, um, the way they're arranged, the temperature of the room, just, just everything about the physical space. And all of these things are interacting in these really complex ways. You see something and tell your friend about it and that makes them see something different and then what they saw makes you see something different and you both tell other people and their prior experience comes in. Um, and so it's, just, it's very hard to predict what's gonna happen in a museum because there are basically infinite factors contributing to what experience is going to happen. So in particular, I was interested in embracing the social context portion of museum learning um, and these guys who wrote the quote before went on to say that conversation is the site of co-construction of meaning. Um, so that process of, of seeing objects differently and it changing you and then changing your perception, that process happens through a, a conversation, through that thing we just made you do. Um, but involved worksheets, like those fill in the blank thick packets that teachers like to give out, prevent students from talking to one another. They prevent conversation from happening. But the good news, or maybe the bad news, because it reflects badly on that somewhat common practice, is that you can really trust students to learn without those constraints. Um, researchers have followed around student groups and recorded <laughs> everything that they were saying to each other, and they found that when moving totally freely, no assignment whatsoever, they were engaged in what's called learning talk 80% of the time. So that's analyzing, comparing, contrasting, all of that really good stuff happening 80% of the time, which is fantastic. And another thing is, if you go to a museum and you see the kids physically just running around, you might get the idea that they're not actually taking anything in because they're just moving so much. But it turns out that almost all of this learning talk happens during the movement, and it's sort of like the connections within the physical space are paralleling the connections within the mental space. So we, in particular, uh, took a trip to the New York Hall of Science, which is a pretty fun science museum in Queens. Um, it's a very kinesthetic museum. Um, it's not such a traditional museum where it's like there are these objects of value that you look at and don't touch. It's, it's really more like a science playground. So the lessons that I decided to, to sort of implement for the field trip um, was to have the students look at maps of the museum, look at exhibit descriptions, and then write two questions based on what they saw, two things that they, they wanted to answer during the trip. 
And then their only job on the field trip was to, to write or draw observations that they would then share when we returned. So there were a couple of reasons that I formulated the assignment this way. So first of all, it's, it's relatively authentic. It's something that as an adult, if you're going to a museum, you could do something similar. You can go to the website, see the map, plan your time, um, and you might not write or draw your observations, but you can text someone about it, you can snap a picture, and you really should be continuing the conversation afterwards. So I think that's an important thing to encourage. But the more explicit um, connection that I made that I actually wrote out on the packet and everything was this this is a form of the scientific method. The exhibit descriptions are your background information. You're formulating your research questions, documenting observations, and then sharing with the scientific community. So as far as field trip structure goes, I, uh, feel, I mean, field trips are, are lots of fun. They can also be a little bit stressful taking 60 children um, out, of, out of the confines of, of the school. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of high energy children. Um, so as far as structure of field trips is concerned, um, I, I, I feel like they, they have their time and place based on the concept you're trying to teach, um, where you're at in a unit. Um, I, have, I have gone on field trips with, with students where things have been very structured, like going to the Museum of Natural History and, and going through the dinosaur hall and having them chart the evolution of the dinosaurs. Um, which, which is all well and good, and I, and I love that, but I also really do love um, giving kids the freedom to explore, um, and I really think that adds to a successful time on, on a trip. Because I, I, I think, especially middle school, you're trying to figure things out on so many levels, and I think kids are just naturally curious, um, and they, I, I think they really enjoy having that freedom of being able to go out into a new environment and see for themselves and, and not be pigeonholed to learn about one specific topic, but they can investigate various topics. Um, so what I loved about what Audrey did, which she just explained to you, is I, I feel like she found the common medium um, between my typical unstructured field trip style, which I've been using more um, over the last year or two, and a very rigid, rigorous field trip where the kids, as Audrey was saying, don't necessarily have tons of time to interact with each other and they're more focused on just trying to get through what they have to get through and it's it's the school day in my mind is just so structured as it is and maybe it's because of my experiences in the informal science world but I really just love letting them explore and investigate for themselves and they really did learn a lot as we as we came to learn and find out um, so now you guys are gonna get to see pictures instead of words um, and pictures of the trip. A lot of them have children and they are all like this. Um, so this was a smell station uh, where you could smell different microbes uh, from extreme environments. Um, and so on one level, this is engaging all the senses, right, and making a really rich experience that way. But also if you think about it, what is a 12 year old gonna do if they smell something that's absolutely awful? They're gonna call over all of their friends and make them smell it. So in addition to, to being a rich sensory experience, this really facilitated all of those social connections. And uh, if they were curious about just what it was that would smell that bad, they could flip up those little black cards and, and see information about the microorganisms. So here are two other exhibits from that sort of life in extreme environments is their life outside of Earth exhibit. Um, on the left, this game was basically operation. Uh, it was meant to represent picking rocks out of a volcano or something, but if your tongs touch the metal, the red light on top would flash and you'd feel bad. Um, <laughs> and then on the right, there was just a microscope with slides. Uh, so the girl in the middle, um, her name is Ella, and Ella was really interested in operation. She wanted to be watching the guy play operation and kind of poking him and seeing if he messed up. But her friend on the right was calling her name constantly, Ella, you have to look at this. Ella, Ella! And so she would go over and, and look at the thing. Um, and so this sort of was not the only instance where people were yelling each other's names across the museum. And I think that hearing all of those names just speaks to how important socializing is to a museum experience. Um, but also just thinking about what could have made Ella so much more interested in watching a game of operation than looking at these unique microscope slides that she might not have an opportunity to see anywhere else is that even though all she could do with operation was antagonize the player, there's no way to help someone play operation, it was still an opportunity to interact through an object rather than about an object in the instance of talking about what you were seeing. 
on the microscope slides. So this is a student drawing, uh, one of the observations. So I'm including it instead of a picture of the actual exhibit. Um, and there was something called a ferrofluid inside and you would crank the sides and the magnets would move and it would make cool patterns in, in the liquid that contained iron. Um, and this was the only exhibit where I saw uh, people look at the placards. Um, every other one, they were too busy doing things, talking, running to the next place. But this object was fascinating enough that the students stopped for a moment and looked and read what was there. Um, and I think that's because this fits more into the traditional museum of model of having valuable objects that don't exist outside of the museum, um, whereas the rest of it was more like a playground. So at this exhibit, which fits more into the traditional museums, they acted like they were at a traditional museum. Uh, the place where I saw the best uh, instances of social learning, social connections, was actually at um, the connections exhibit. Uh, it's hard to see here because there are so many kids gathered around both of the stations, but these are virtual arm wrestling stations where they had a little metal arm that would uh, push against you with the same pressure that the other people were. Uh, theoretically, you could play virtual arm wrestling with people in uh, science museums in, in China and stuff, but they were just playing against each other. Uh, so it's interesting that they're interacting with each other but, but not looking at each other. <laughs> Um, and arm wrestling through the metal instead of just arm wrestling each other, and I'm sure that they thought about that as well. Uh, but it was also great because this was one of the exhibits that our students in wheelchairs could use, and since it is such a kinesthetic museum, there were a lot of aspects of the trip that weren't open to them. And finally, this was actually an exhibit that brought together our student group and other student groups, which normally there isn't a lot of interaction that happens that way. But uh, we have some of our students on the left side, but also one of our students is on the right side helping students from a different school. Um, so this was another table within the Connections exhibit. And basically, the way that one person moved their wire and metal piece would change the way another person's operated, and things lit up and, and made noises. Um, there wasn't any common goal, so I didn't see <coughs> people talking about working towards or how, how things were interacting, and just sort of silently feeling the effects of other people's actions. Compared to, you can see in the back, right next to it, there's this pulley exhibit. Uh, with the pulleys, people were talking about how their actions were affecting each other, so there was actual conversation happening. Um, with the pulleys, you could work with someone to create something, uh, you could work against someone, or for a short period of time, you could work completely separate from someone else, uh, if there weren't all four people playing, at least. Um, so I don't know why it was that the pulleys engaged students in, in actual conversation about how their actions were affecting one another's, and the table did not, and maybe it would have been different for a different student group. It, it's just something that I observed. So another part of the Connections exhibit, it was a pretty cool exhibit, there are a lot of pictures from it. Um, so on the right is an analog board where these black circles would flip and become yellow, and it said exactly the same thing that was on the computer, so part of it was just novelty. Um, people would come over because there was this big cool board and they could type their name on it. Um, but the goal of the game was to create a pattern that would reproduce itself. So the way the board really came into play was that it facilitated social interaction in a way that a computer screen doesn't. Um, in addition to the person sort of backseat driving behind the person playing the game, you can have someone up front pointing to where they want to go instead of having everyone crowded around the computer. And uh, when the student finally won the game, he was so adamant that I need to talk to the lady, the science woman, which is museum docent. Um, all she said to him was, the point of this game is to make a pattern that reproduces itself. And that was it, he needed to impress her. Like just, just with that one interaction, um, he was living up to that challenge. She would also, if someone was just trying to write their name, try to encourage them to, to go a little deeper into the material and the experience by telling them to try to make a pattern that keeps going. And if they were struggling, she would give them some tips. Like I heard her say, draw a snake. Um, this was another really interesting object, just because there was no placard. It was completely out of context. It, it's just a sort of spherical uh, aquarium. Um, there was an aquatic plant and a rock and a lot of tiny shrimp in it. Ab like, it was completely unclear to me why this was in the museum. But that makes it especially interesting because all of the things that I heard people saying around it were purely their own projections of their own ideas and the things they were learning onto the object. Uh, so with this particular girl, she was trying to name the shrimp. She saw two or three shrimp, and she was like, this one named this, this one is named this. 
And then another girl came along and told her to look down. And she looks down and sees thousands and thousands of these tiny shrimp. And it was it looked to me like she was having a moment of sort of ethical quandary that she thought these were all pets, but then she saw just the multitude of them and they were all identical um, and sort of reconsidering whether she could view these tiny shrimp in that way. So I'm sure that is not an experience, experience that the creators of the museum could have possibly predicted because it's just purely a uh, projection of their experiences. And uh, this also got um, one of the chaperones, I was an English teacher, interacting with the students. Um, he was convinced that it was a self-sustaining ecosystem. There was no placard. I don't know whether it was a self-sustaining ecosystem, but he was really interested in that and talking to the students about it. And uh, to sort of finish up our discussion of what was happening during the museum trip, um, this was a scale that would change the level of water and tell you how much water was in your body. And, uh, the most interesting thing that I heard was how does it know how much is our body and how much is our clothes, which is an example of the students questioning the museum itself. Um, and I feel like that's a really interesting type of interaction is, you know, not accepting the authority of the museum and thinking about things scientifically before just taking the authority of the institution. So how did all of that wonderful classwork fit in? Um, we elicited some really thoughtful questions from taking the time to let them look through the exhibit descriptions and write their questions. But because of time constraints, the students all only went to two different exhibits and some of them went to none of the exhibits that interested them. Uh, so what I was doing was basically just setting them up for disappointment. They didn't get to answer the questions they were so excited to answer. Um, so an idea I would have for the future would be to group people based on the exhibits they want to go to so that they could be sure to see the exhibits they want to see. Um, I also learned a bit more about how to engage with students while I'm on a trip. Um, I had this idea that I would be the, the great teacher who helped them engage more deeply with the content. So when a student was really excited about something and told me about it, I started asking her questions to make her think more deeply. Uh, why does it work that way? Why do you want to try it differently? And I could see her as I was asking these questions just get viscerally frustrated with me. And what I realized I was doing when she ran away <laughs> um, was that I wasn't participating in the social contract of this museum space. This was all about sensory overload experience and then process later, and that's how the students were interacting. There was nothing that could be gained from in that moment asking deeper questions. The deeper questions could have been answered later. She'd kind of taken in the experience and she could have thought about it later on. Um, and so that's why she was really frustrated. And I just kind of, you know, listening to how students are, are reacting to how you're interacting with them and, uh, she, this is not a student who generally uh, is scared of having, you know, people ask her deeper questions and having to think about things more deeply. It was just in this particular context. Uh, a lot of people lost their worksheets because everything at this museum required both of your hands. Um, so they were just basically at, at every corner uh, dropping off their worksheets and so probably most of them lost their worksheets. So one idea I had, particularly if you take a lot of field trips, is to get them tiny notebooks that they can put in their pockets, um, which is partly really exciting because it makes you feel like a field scientist. Um, it's something novel, so maybe they would value it and, and try harder not to lose it, um, but also would just allow them to use both of their hands. And finally, uh, we saw a lot of sharing for the class that met right when we got back from the trip. They had tons of things to say and questions to ask. Um, and so I assumed that the, the class that met on Monday would also have tons to say, but they didn't really remember what had happened. Um, a weekend was in between the trip and then, and so they didn't have much to say, and I wish that, I'd read their observations, so I wish I would have prepared things to prompt them with, but I just thought that they would be overflowing with information like the class I met immediately afterward, but that was not the case. And another thing that I think could help with that would be instead of to just have an instance of, you will have a chance to share with your peers to actually have them take more ownership of it by making it a more formal presentation, maybe with a, a poster or something. So that is our talk. Uh, this is another student drawing. Do you guys have any questions? <laughs> Ended rather abruptly, I know, sorry.
so that you can't leave until there's a <laughs> discussion. I have a question, actually. Um, so how do you keep the students on the field trip engaged in the actual material at the museum rather than like running off like, in social groups? Because the material at the museum is more exciting. I mean, you so might have a different that answer that. was never a problem. I remember when I was young and I was at museums, sometimes I wasn't actually paying attention. I mean, so, I don't know. It was a long time ago, but that's when I wanted to hang out with my friend. Or I, how do you like? When, when we when we group them, I, I group kids based on who. I, 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 <laughs> there are some kids who you just know you just can't have with other kids. So right. in order to make it successful, they would actually stay focused. Um, we definitely spread spread them apart and the major players who, who are high energy were spread out. Okay, so you do factor in the group thing in this. Yes. Yes. Um, what are like, the major differences between like your relationship with the kids and like your relationship with the kids? And like how do you see it differently? If they do? Mm-hmm. You want to answer that? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm not I'm I'm not so sure either. I I, I mean it, it, what's, what's something I've observed is I feel like they, they because they've known me since September and I'm the, the enforcer in the room, I think they view me as the authoritative figure, but I, I do feel like they, they've they learned a lot from Audrey. Like, and, and they've, they learned from both of us, but Audrey doesn't necessarily have to play the, the authoritative role. So I think in a lot of ways they're actually more willing to, to listen to you on some level because they, they know that. I'm kind of like the person who, who who makes them stop doing one thing and then move on to the other, and she's able to 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 move around the room and has been extremely helpful and has really guided a lot of kids towards understanding things that maybe they wouldn't have necessarily had such a solid understanding of. Yes. Oh, I have a question for you. Given uh, a recent discussion that you and I have had about um, assessment, <laughs> um, uh, what kind of informal and formal assessment that you had mentioned the the potential of having presentations at the end, um, but then how during the actual enactment of this trip, you being there, you want to relish in like the inquiry that's happening, but at the same time, how do you assess whether students are um, learning? Um, so I took the approach of listening to their conversations mm-hmm. after doing a reading called listening in on museum conversations. <laughs> um, so, you know, seeing this, um, I don't know if this is an instance of learning from the museum, mm-hmm. uh, questioning the scale, but I think that that is like right on the money in terms of scientific thought. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a really good indication to me that that student is getting it. Um, this was a relevant sort of observations. Um, Yeah, I mean, a lot of the learning that happened was not really about the content, definitely not about like standards and tests um, in terms of thinking about connections, but I mean, I could see like at this table that even though they weren't talking, they were sort of changing what they were doing based on what others were doing. Um, and it, it's, it goes back to, you know, especially with museums, you have to let go of some control because you can't predict what experience the visitor is going to have. Um, but seeing that, that there is definitely cognitive development happening in some form, and that's good stuff. Do you do you have anything about how you know if students learn from field trips? I mean, I think just having looked over what Audrey prepared in terms of the question, the questions that they they wrote, um, some of them were really insightful. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think they're they're curious. They, they, they were trying to make sense of a new world that was around them. And it, it, for a lot of them, it is sensory overload. Um, there's a lot of things to do there. But it also sounded like, uh, through your presentation, Audrey, that you were highlighting some of the um, social skills that students were learning uh, along the way. Um, so interacting with one another, interacting with students that they were unfamiliar with from other schools, yeah. um, collaboration, those kind of things as well. So um, sounds like a lot of great stuff. Did yeah. you guys debrief at the museum and you debriefed after and how did that whole conversation come go? Um, 
we just debriefed after. Um, we just kind of herded them onto the buses. Uh, they were, I don't know, they just eaten lunch when we were leaving there. There are lots of physical stuff, uh, like the process of being a body that's 12 years old that you have to think about in teaching in addition to, to just the ideal way of presenting information. Um, so we basically just got them on the buses. And then there was one seventh grade class that met right when we got back and we debriefed with them. We debriefed with the other class on Monday. And as I told you, it would have been better if we had solidified that knowledge a little better, at least had some guiding questions. A weekend's a long time. Yes. So trips are wonderful, but teachers are being asked to teach to the common core standards. They're, they're being given set curricula. How do you see a trip like this fitting into what you're expected to teach from on high, whether it be state standards, common core standards, um, school expectations? How does, how does the trip fit in? How would you justify it to parents, administrators, like why you would want to take a trip like this? Do you have anything? Okay. <laughs> um, so I think that the way I modeled the, the field trip assignment um, is just, you know, scientific method, which the Common Core State Standards for Science are not that demanding. Um, they, they aren't really content specific. The state standards are, but in terms of Common Core Standards, it's basically just understanding the scientific method and, and being able to use it. Um, so this is an example of, of applying that. Um, there was also uh, a lot of things that were relevant to some of the content that they were gonna be doing uh, with the life on other planets. Um, definitely had connection to the heredity unit that they were about, that they were in the middle of, and uh, to the geology unit that they do the next year, and astronomy. Um, so it was introduction to a lot of different things. Did you notice, this might be hard to measure, but did you notice a change in the students' excitement about science, pre museum, and post museum? Mm. Did you? Hard to say. I I feel like I feel like there are a good a good amount of kids who are legitimately interested in science. Um, others who who really could care less and are kind of checked out. But that could be for for other reasons of external factors going on in their life. I mean, I know for a fact it is with a, lot, with a bunch of our kids. Um, I don't know. I. I, I when we, when we got back from the field trip and 701 was sharing out, I mean, they were, it, it seemed like, it seemed like we had the, we had the attention of all of them. I mean, yeah. even, even some of the more quiet kids were willing to put themselves out there and actually share a thought, which is kind of huge for some of them. Too. They're shy. Yeah, what I was going to say was that we had students who, who would never raise their hand in science class who were raising their hand after the field trip to talk about what they'd seen. Um, just like they were calling each other's names at the museum for the friends who were in different groups They wanted a chance to tell them uh, when we got back Just to piggyback off her question later on down you know later in the class um, Further in the semester should say did you see anybody go back and say oh, yeah We remember seeing that at the, the museum like kind of just referencing even though it wasn't in the media it was kind of later in the line We're still on heredity um, so not really, I haven't, no. I wish I could say yes. <laughs> that would be great support for the field trip, but no, unfortunately not. But also there may be opportunities for you, Audrey, to be able to bring up something yeah. that um, an exhibit or even one of these visuals, I can imagine I was thinking yeah. about, like if the lag of the weekend was hard for them to come back with the same excitement, just showing them an action yeah. maybe uh, would have been able to kind of bring them back to some of the original excitement. So. The logistics question. Um, so you said that you had them look at maps and then come up with questions based on what they were interested in before going to the museum. But then some kids didn't get to answer their questions because they didn't get to the part of the museum where they wanted to be. How did you decide what parts of the museum you were going to go to? We basically just left it to the groups. Um, there was one chaperone with a few kids, and whichever kid basically won the argument. I 
I think we should have grouped maybe by if they wanted to go to. But then you also have to consider the, the group dynamic factor. So maybe, you know, it, things are never going to be ideal. But yeah, a lot of kids did get to go to the ones that interested them. But a lot of the ones that interested most of them was the sports challenge, which had a lot of long lines um, to do things like throw a ball and see how fast it was. Um, so it took a while. Such a, so many things for them to be to be looking at. I, de I definitely tend to narrow the focus, like a, a focus on evolution. I was um, talking about that before. That's you know, and, and then there's the whole hall of you know, gems and minerals, which is huge in terms of the world of geology. Um, there's so many different av avenues to explore, so it's, it's it's typically more structured when we go to such a large place. But because the hall of science really is just so engaging, I. Um, I've, I gave them um, quite a bit of choice, and I, I really do love your idea that we, we should, you know, we could even like color code that question sheet for next year, or even we can even go with the eighth grade and take them there and, and yeah. try to group them and see how that works. I mean, unfortunately, going on a trip with the New York City school with the, pu the bus system, it's a very quick turnaround. They, they uh, won't come before 9.30, and you have to be back by 1.30, so. And it was an hour away in Queens, so. We, by the time we got off, we basically had an hour and a half to, to, to do our thing.